many years ago, I went to jump the cave in Mexico. It's a place called Sultano de las Colindrinas. My Spanish pronunciation is terrible, but it's the cave of the swallows. Uh, and it's in southern Mexico near a city called Tampico. Mm. And <clears throat> it's illegal to jump now, but at the time it was legal and there were expeditions going there. You could sign up for a trip, but there was an American guy named Mark Lickley doing trips. There were some Norwegian guys doing trips. I think Din Lichensky did some trips. Anyway. Uh, and I think Jay Epstein in Colorado did some trips. And they would organize this expedition where they would, you would pay them and they would, you know, rent the cars and, and organize and get all the hotel rooms and stuff. And that was no small feat because it was, it was primitive third world southern Mexico. Uh, so it was probably worth paying them. And different people had different costs. So I went on a trip <clears throat> that the Norwegians had organized. Uh, and there were, it was a really good trip uh, in lots of senses. Uh, because the cast of characters on that trip, the jumpers who had come, were particularly good. Uh, there were these Norwegians who had a ton of jumping experience, one of whom was, you know, essentially the guy who had opened up Sherog to the world. Not, he wasn't the first jumper off the cliff, but he was the guy who organized like boats and trains and stuff, or, and, and vans and stuff so that everybody could jump it regularly. Uh, and then there was a, a friend of mine, a guy named Christopher McDougall. Uh, we like to think of him as Mr. McDougall. <laughs> Maybe he'll listen to this and laugh. Now, he, everyone in the world knows the guy is Dugues because Australians can't use anyone's proper name. Uh, and he is today one of the world's leading base jumpers. And he was on that trip. Uh, my friend Eero, who was a Finnish base jumper, who was Finland base one, was on the trip. Uh, and then Rick and Randy Harrison, who are, like, at this point, the, the godfathers of old school base jumping. They started base jumping in, like, in the late 70s. And, you know, remember how I said base jumpers have numbers? Yeah. You finish all four. Well, mm -hmm. Rick is the guy who actually gives the numbers out, right? Oh, and, yeah. and Rick is a very uh, smart and, on paper, very respectable guy. <clears throat> He's a... Uh, he spent most of his career working for the government. He was a U.S. attorney, uh, so he's a lawyer, uh, and he has argued in one cases at the U.S. Supreme Court, which for a lawyer is like winning the Super Bowl. Like he's a, he's a rock star lawyer, mm -hmm. uh, and so we had this this cast of characters of these people who just had this huge breadth of experience and were really interesting to hang out with. Uh, and I remember we finished jumping one day, uh, and we're down at the bottom of the cave, and. You know, you've had this great day. You've had this experience jumping into what was probably the best object I've ever jumped off of. Like, it's, the visuals are incredible. Uh, it's unlike any other object anywhere in the world because you're falling down a shaft and there's just stuff all around you on all sides. There's no open sky anywhere. You just Everywhere you look, there's walls going by. Mm. Uh, and so we're at the bottom of this cave and you're waiting to get hoisted out. And what's happening is you jump during the day in the cave because at night there's thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, I mean, of birds, swallows that live on the walls of the cave. Mm -hmm. And you don't jump when they're there because it disturbs them. And during the day, they fly out into the jungle to, you know, f eat and do their forage thing. and yeah. do their bird thing, right? Mm -hmm. And at night, they fly back into the cave, into their nests on the walls of this cave. And so you jump after they leave, and then when they come back, you stop jumping. And the last load of the day, as you're getting hoisted out, all these birds are flying back into the cave. And it's like, a, I mean, it's like a, a boiling mass of birds. It's like a sea of birds surging around. Mm. It looks solid. It's crazy. I mean, just picture 100,000 birds in the air at the same time yeah. flying into the same narrow space. And you're suspended on a cable being winched up to the top of this 1,200-foot drop through this just seething, boiling mass of wow. birds, right? Whoa. And you've just spent all day jumping. And so we're at the bottom, and it's, I don't know, our fourth or fifth day. Uh, and I think we were there for... 10 or 11 days. And uh, <laughs> Rick, who's a very respectable lawyer who works for the US government, who has the equivalent civil service rank of like a two-star general, is walking around with an eyedropper of, it's a Visine bottle that's full of LSD. And he's like, open your mouth. And he's just dropping LSD on everybody's tongues before you get winched out. And it's kind of a funny story because Dukes, who has a reputation in the base world as the super wild, loose, crazy guy who's always partying, was the straight sober guy for this experience. He was the guy who did not do the LSD. And he stood at the bottom of the winch hooking everybody up to mm. make sure everybody was safe on the winch out because you're tripping. Yeah. Right. And so he's the guy who makes sure that you're actually clipped in properly before you get yanked up <laughs> for 15 minutes on this cable through this, you know, 1,200 feet of boiling birds while on acid after a day of base jumping. Jesus. Right. And the cable itself, it's not 100% stable. It's straight up and down, but it's sort of, you're sort of slowly rotating in a 360 degree circle as you go up. So, yeah. so you're sort of slowly rotating, and it probably takes you three or four minutes to rotate all the way around 360 degrees. So you make three or four rotations before you get to the top, and you're just getting hoisted up. And it's you and one other guy, right, going up. And uh, <laughs> I, was, I was the last one out. And so Dugues was coming out with me because he had hooked everybody else up. And I remember him hooking me up. And there's two positions on the cable. And he's like, I'm hooking you at the bottom because if you spew, I want you below me. <laughs> <laughs> and so we get hoisted out. And it was just this incredible, like, 
15 minutes of crazy swirling madness after a day of base jumping on LSD. And then you hike back out through this third world Mexican village that doesn't even have power, right? Yeah. And you get back to your cars and you drive back into town and you're in this little village called Aquisman, which is still very third world, right? Uh, and we're in Aquisman and Iro, who was my roommate for this trip, I, I walk back into the room and he's sitting in the bathroom staring at the shower. And it's like there's one light, one naked bulb. There's water dripping. There's, you know, it's sort of shadowy because there's just this one bulb in this room with no windows. And I walk in there and he's sitting there staring at the shower very intently. I'm like, what, what are you doing? He's like, I'm watching TV. <laughs> I was like, oh what? God. He's like, this is like watching TV. Oh, my God. <laughs> And then I sat there with him for probably, I don't know how long it was because you lose track of time. But I sat there with him just watching the just dripping water in the shower. Yeah, it was, yeah, those are the kind of experiences that you have that you remember even better than all the jumps on that trip. <laughs>